this, uh, yeah. So Cornish Lithium was founded in uh, 2016. It's a private company. Uh, and it was founded upon the premise that uh, there's huge untapped potential for uh, lithium to be found within brines in the subsurface in Cornwall. Uh, and that it is, uh, would be possible to responsibly extract the lithium from in this particular domain. And that idea really came from historical data from Cornwall's mining past. So this figure on the right hand side that you can see here is um, a cross section through the ground. So uh, in the subsurface of all of the mine work of, of this particular mine, United Mines, and the mine workings where they worked the different what they called loads, which were the structures which contained the uh, the elements of interest. Um, in this case, it was copper and tin. But they happen to have noted here that there was hot water issuing in great quantities from, um, from the workings and that it was rich in lithia. Now, at this point in the mid 1800s, there was actually no use for lithium uh, and it had only just been discovered. So no lithium was ever worked or, or uh, in, in this time. But this was really good evidence that there was uh, something interesting going on in Cornwall. And so we quickly got to work securing mineral rights from over 15% of the uh, area of Cornwall now. Um, and we've, we have recently uh, been undergoing some crowdfunding, um, raised around 6 million in, in crowdfunding and uh, are also supported by several government and innovation grants as well. So the big question I suppose is, is why lithium? Uh, why, why would we be looking for lithium at this time? As uh, I think we all know now, this, we're in the midst of what we call climate emergency. And on, on the bottom left of this slide, we've got the um, CO2 concentration in parts per million over the last 800,000 years. And I think this nicely illustrates since the uh, Industrial Revolution really quite how much carbon dioxide has increased in the atmosphere, now currently up to around 417 parts per million. And in the Paris Climate Accord, we've committed to trying to reduce uh, global warming by 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade. So this is going to require huge decarbonisation, both of the, uh, the way that we produce energy, but uh, also uh, transport and um, other areas of our lives, really. So the, all of this is going to require low carbon technologies, such as wind turbines and solar panels. Um, but both of these types of energy are quite sporadic in their, uh, their, their temporal distribution. So the sun doesn't always shine and the, the wind doesn't always blow. And that's where batteries come into things, you know, to store this energy for the grid, for, for distribution when it's, uh, when it's needed. And the, uh, the World Bank estimates, estimates that uh, there's going to be around a 500% increase in battery metal demand by 2050. So this is um, a, a figure from the Visual Capitalists based on World Bank uh, data. And I think of interest here, firstly, is copper, which is the uh, demand in 2050 is projected to go up by 7% based on 2017 uh, production. And an interesting little fact on the right-hand side, in the last 5,000 years, um, we've produced about 550 uh, million tonnes of copper but the world will need about the same amount of copper in only the next 25 years to meet global demand, which is, is quite staggering. And then when we look up to the top of the graph, graph, we have lithium with the highest increase in demand, and that's projected around 965%. And this is owing mostly to the fact that there is a lot of lithium needed for uh, batteries from smartphones all the way through to electric vehicles with around distribution of around 10 to 63 kilograms of lithium needed in every electric vehicle. And all of these countries on the right hand side made commitments that 100% of new electric vehicles will be, um, sorry, 100% of new vehicles will be electric vehicles between these dates. Uh, and so with those commitments in mind, some studies have been done that if um, it's 100% electric vehicle penetration, which means every vehicle in in the world suddenly had to be electric vehicles, then that would equate to something crazy, which is 2,898% increase in demand in lithium. So this is what's really driving this uh, exploration of lithium. There's a mismatch between the huge demand and the relatively modest production, uh, which, which is happening at the moment. So lithium at the moment is mined primarily in Australia and uh, Chile. Uh, the, Lithium, which is mined in Australia, comes from hard rock, 
which is called uh, spodumene. And this involves taking, digging, digging a big, big open pit, crushing the material, roasting it to high temperatures. Because it's Australia and they've got plentiful coal, they use coal to reach those high temperatures, which is obviously very bad uh, for the environment. And then in Chile, they use brines, but this is brines pumped up to the surface and then left with the hot, uh, under the hot sun, left to evaporate and concentrate the lithium. And so this is obviously causes big problems in areas that are already water scarce in that they use vast quantities of water and uh, evaporate it off. And the big thing is that there's a big gap here in the European Union and the UK, where we have hardly any production of lithium, um, but one of the biggest car markets uh, in the world. So if you're buying an electric car in Europe, it's lithium's probably come from Australia, been processed in China, and then been shipped over to Europe before it's even been driven uh, off the forecourt. So if we can create uh, production closer to where things are being consumed, then that can only reduce carbon miles in, for example, electric vehicles, which can only be a good thing. So that's a little bit about why lithium, but then this question, what we're doing in Cornwall, so what have we done to this point? And then crucially, how will data challenge really help us uh, to achieving our goals? So Cornwall is uh, blessed geologically in that it has one of only five large scale lithium enriched granites uh, in the world uh, present in the subsurface. And this brings uh, great quantities of lithium, uh, but also because the granite was once molten rock, uh, it also has uh, lots of leftover heat. So the county is also really uh, a, literally a hotspot for uh, geothermal energy exploration uh, in Cornwall as well. And this is a map of the, uh, the extent of the granite in the subsurface uh, beneath Cornwall. And this extends to great depths. It's only exposed on the surface in places where it's been uncovered, but it's actually present beneath the entire county. Um, so the entire of Cornwall is perspective potentially for both heat and for, uh, for lithium. And because of its rich uh, mining past, I mean, it's been around 4,000 years of mining in Cornwall that, that we know of or have evidence for. Um, we've used this historical data, so these mine sections and plans to make maps of all of the mineralized structures throughout the county. So in, we have the green and the red lines mapped on, on this figure on the left, show the distribution of those structures. Uh, and these structures in the subsurface have what we call natural permeability. So there's, there are gaps in the rock. Uh, and through these gaps, uh, liquid can actually uh, flow if the gaps are large enough. Um, and it's the target of the water within these gaps, these natural fractures, which we are, we are looking to, uh, to exploit. So we have four major exploration streams, and I'm going to focus uh, mostly on the first two because that's where myself and Ali's expertise lie. But we are looking for lithium in the shallow surface, shallow subsurface, which means around two kilometers in depth below the surface. We have um, the deep geothermal, which is down to 5,000 meters below surface, and that's used getting lithium and uh, geothermal heat. Uh, and generating electricity from the same borehole. And then we have the more traditional hard rock lithium source and also exploration for the other battery metals, which is copper, tin, and zinc. And this figure here is our schematic for, for where these are actually held. So um, the hard rock lithium uh, exploration is taking place in pre-existing pits, which were actually China, originally China clay pits. And the, the major benefit of this is that we don't have to ourselves um, destroy any greenfield sites. We're using area which has already been exposed. Um, and also we have developed some technology which can vastly reduce the amount of energy needed to extract lithium. Uh, and, and that's one of the big selling points of our hard rock lithium stream. For our lithium in other geothermal waters, it's uh, as the case of drilling boreholes into structures to pump out the lithium, which is in the water, and couple that with use of the heat either through direct electric electricity generation, 
uh, in the deep system or through uh, direct uses of heat, such as uh, heating or for agriculture, for greenhouses. And these are all uh, avenues that we're exploring um, paired with our uh, mineral exploration. So, so far to date, anyway, we've drilled uh, two uh, one kilometer deep research holes in our shallow system. And these were really proof of concept holes. And I'll show you in the next few slides how, how we got to that point using the data that we have. But the long and short of it was that we successfully isolated waters from that depth. And that was the first time, apart from historical data, that we could actually prove the waters were there. So that was quite a big deal. And that was in uh, 2019. Um, and since then, we've just been doing uh, testing on the resulting waters. And then we have the deep geothermal system where uh, Geothermal Engineering Limited drilled to five kilometers. And they proved um, a grade of over 200 milligrams per litre uh, lithium, which is globally significant. Um, but crucially, with low dissolved solids, which means that you, get, you don't get any scaling in the pipes and it's much easier to, to deal with. And they reach temperatures of over almost uh, 200 degrees as well. So that's enough to generate directly electricity for the grid uh, as, a, as by the depths. And the big thing with our lithium in geothermal waters is that we are doing direct extraction. So there's no use, no need for evaporating off any water or anything like that from which you wouldn't be able to do in Cornwall. Um, this process would extract lithium and leave. Um, and leave water which is desalinated so is either for use potentially for agriculture but could also be uh, put back down into the ground so there's uh, minimal if any waste involved in this uh, process and this is our vision for Cornwall exploration in Cornwall it's boreholes with small units set on top of them potentially even as small as a container ship size uh, units so contain, ship, uh, containers that go on ships, that is. Um, and then we can use the electricity and heat in local uh, infrastructure. So the data that we, we use for this, I've mentioned historical mining data, and that's uh, where the mining journal ties in. We also use more innovative techniques, um, such as airborne geophysical surveys and uh, satellite data, as well as actually getting out into the field and, and mapping the rocks ourselves, which is... There's a photo in the bottom left here of us on a uh, kayaking mapping trip uh, this summer, which was quite enjoyable. Um, but the only way really we can see directly into subsurface is through these uh, this mine data, these mine plans and sections. And from these that we can digitize structures. And then when we combine multiple of those, we can map these structures in the subsurface. Um, in 3D and extrapolate them along stride. And then we can target them with boreholes and this maximizes our chance of hitting these structures. And, and this is what we did with the shallow geothermal system in 2019. But none of this would really be possible without this historical data, which is quite amazing considering it's, it comes from over 165 years ago um, or older. So hopefully that's given you a bit of a context of um, why we need this historic data and how useful it can be. Now Ali's going to talk a little bit about Mind Journal and the, uh, the challenge itself. Yeah, uh, cheers Alex. Um, yeah, so as Alex has already mentioned, these, this historical data is really important to our sort of journey and our um, exploration effort. So I'm just going to take you through, um, take you through a little bit on why and how this OCR work on the mine on the mining journal that we've chosen to use in this challenge is, is really important. So as a bit of background for the mining journal, it was a uh, journal that was founded in 1835 by Henry English, who was actually a London stockbroker. And he sort of initially started publishing information on mining developments and mining innovations within the UK. Um, as well as board meetings for the Railway and Commercial um, Gazette. But since then, and throughout the years since then, it's sort of evolved into a real collection and real sort of treasure trove of information on UK mining, including production statistics, any new innovations in the, in the sector, 
and um, mine expansions and mine and sort of any any information on the on mining within the UK is sort of being collected in this uh, um, incredible resource that is the Mining Journal, and we have um, we have the editions all the way from when it was founded from 1835 up till 1940. But the the edition that we've chosen for this challenge is um, is the paper from 1864, which actually has quite a lot of importance to Cornish Lithium because that was the year that um, uh, Miller discovered lithium issuing out of these fractures within within the subsurface in Cornwall, and that's where Alex showed you the original sort of schematic or section of the United Mines where where it was first noted. But um, so the challenge itself is to use OCR, so optical optical character recognition to extract keywords and extract information from the from this edition of the journal and throughout some of the slides later on i've outlined some ideas some initial ideas some starting points as to what sort of information we would we think would be important for our um sort of evaluation of these journals but really i want to open the floor for you guys to to have a to have a go at it and to think outside the box as to what how to characterize information and how to how best to sort that into some sort of database but um anyway so this is just uh, an example of some tabulated data that that's within the journal as well as lots of um submissions so article submissions by various different authors so the layout of the journal this is quite a um so this is the first page of the which edition was this? Is this, a, this is the first one? Yes, uh, eighteen thirty-five. Yeah. So this is this is one of the very first editions of the journal, and as you can see, this is quite difficult to read at this resolution. But um, this, which is why regular OCR has sometimes struggled with with this. But the the edition we've chosen is actually a bit more. Uh, a bit more easy to read than this one <laughs> you'll be pleased to hear but um so there's article uh, it's in sort of a form of articles like this as well as um so this is an example of some of the some of the information that we're really interested in so this is really mind specific information so it describes the geological setting of the mine and how much of the lows so and how much of the mineralized vein they might have worked through and what sort of structures they've hit and this is this is really key this is really key for us to be able to build up a really good picture of what's going on in the subsurface and we can use this sort of information to improve and further define our geological models um, as, as well as that, there's there's other really key bits of information, such as this tabulated sort of data that discusses production statistics. So where mines might be the most profitable or where they might be producing the most of a certain commodity or certain ore, we can use this to model where mines might have started to become um, or started to run out of certain commodities or where they might have... Uh, been starting to get into troubles, troubles in terms of uh, loads or mineralized veins running out. So we can really dig into this sort of information to help improve our um, regional prospectivity outlook within Cornwall. Um, but this is an example of some of the tabulated sort of data that we'd like to be able to analyze. And then as well as, as, well as that, there are also some notes of plans and sections so this is an example of the wheel bore area um, and we just highlighted the sort of information that we had that is quite key to uh, which is quite key for us to be able to dig back into these journals and to find where this um, find where this map may have come from so if we wanted more information or if somebody wanted more information around the wheel bore area we might be able to search for this and then we would find find this section or find this old map so we could add this to our model uh, add this to our model if we decide to expand or if we decide to have a greater look in this area and um 
Um, and as you can see, these lineaments here, these uh, lines are, all represent different loads, so different mineralized veins that we that may well be um, host to these permeable or to this permeability that Alex described earlier. So this is all really key information and will really help improve what, what we want to do as, as Cornish Lithium, as a lithium in geothermal waters exploration company. <laughs> so what is the challenge? I've sort of discussed it a bit already, but what we want to be able to do is essentially um, we want the data to, tra to be transformed into a, into a usable format so that we can then go back and analyze ourselves or, or be able to analyze key outputs from this, um, from this journal. And we can then use this as a resource for further battery metal exploration within the region. Um, so specific areas that interest us within the journals that we've had a look at from <laughs> sifting through them very briefly. So we, we're really interested in any mines and any data related to any of the mines um, within Cornwall, information on commodities and um, product, uh, productivity uh, statistics, anything to do with water and wells and springs anything in that sort of direction because they obviously directly relates to uh relates to us discover us uh our exploration efforts and any geological features as well so um loads and mineralized veins and uh all sorts of all sorts of stuff like that and we'll be able to provide a list of key geological words that that we know are of interest to us in this uh in these journals and desired outputs that we'd be looking for would be a working OCR tool um, so that the documents are searchable in some way, um, a usable database of keyword mentions, so um, where the locations of these key of these words may be within each of the journals that uh, from the keyword library that we'll be able to provide. And then a brief memo on, on the process, really, because we're quite interested to see how your OCR process might might have worked compared to um, others who are for sort of others who have tried who have not been able to do this. So, in, uh, so any successes or failures or difficulties or problems you might have had along the way. <laughs> um, uh, so we we came up with a list of suggested outputs, but really we want you guys to think out of the box and think of some interesting ways to visualize the data and um, anything that you find in the literature around OCR. To, to aid in, in the process of creating this OCR database. But these are some ideas that we, that we came up with. So extracting images with data, with metadata. So where the page number, where, where it might exist within the journal, any word clouds. So um, what words come up most often, temporal word, words trends. So how often a word or a keyword might appear within the journal or within the year and how it changes throughout time. And um, a word association. So, if a um, so this might be useful for us because we can then associate certain mines with certain uh, certain commodities or certain structures. Um, a database of mine names and where they occur within the journal because we're very well they're very geographically tied. So if we can search for a mine name, then we all know where we can look. Um, Sort of where we can plot it in real space and then any other sort of visualization tools so i've just kind of <laughs> uh, put a few examples up here but really i think the idea is to be creative with this there's these, these are just suggestions or just a way to ignite your imagination maybe of how of how you might be able to process this and how you might be able to create something really cool for us uh, for the challenge so um and that's it, really. Uh, are there any questions? Do we have time for questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you both. For that's a really interesting overview. Um, we've got about 10 minutes or so to have a little discussion around questions. Um, if okay. I can kick off with a couple of questions, um, then I'll kind of go around the, the table. Um, if you don't want to um, speak on camera, uh, you can always ask the question in the chat and I'll ask it on your behalf if you prefer to do that. 
Um, so question from me is, um, yeah. uh, two initial questions. The, the, the data that we can play with, the journals, are they publicly available? Or is there a URL that we can get a sample from? Um, what's the best way to kind of start um, attacking the data? Yes, that's a, that's a very good question. They are actually um, originally stored on microfilm at the British Library, which we had to get special permission for them to digitize for us. Um, and then I had to request uh, an open access agreement with the British Library. So we're able to provide a single edition for the challenge, and that's in a JPEG format. So it's split up page by page, and we'll be able to um, provide the journal in that format. And that was something I wanted to discuss with you, maybe now or maybe afterwards, how best we could share that information. Yeah, I, th I think um, for people to kind of um, have a go, um, some people like to work individually, some people like to work in groups, some people might um, have a, a coffee or a shower and come up with an idea yeah. and spontaneously want to have a go. So if they're easy to access, perhaps, um, you know, uh, on a public website, whether it's Dropbox or Google Drive yeah. or, or even your own kind of Cornish Lithium website, if you share a, a link to them, um, that, that'd be great. And um, I don't know how much data there is. It might be an idea to sort of say, well, here's a subset of that data exactly. of those yeah. journals to have a go with. And then once you think you've got um, a method working, you can try it on a different set as well. Uh, that might be quite good for sort of benchmarking and, and testing. Yeah. Um, what sort of scale are, are we looking at? Are we looking at sort of thousands and thousands of pages at the moment? Or, or is it sort of dozens or, or, or what, what we Well, it's at? the, we weren't quite sure what the scale of the challenge was going to be. So we've made available for access the entirety of the catalog from 1864 so from january until december and wow. the cat the journal split up into monthly editions but in total it's about 500 pages right okay yep yep that's fantastic uh and the second question i wanted to ask was um um what have you tried so far um and that's interesting for people around the table because um, it may be something that they're thinking of already, or maybe they've got a similar idea that's a variation of what you've tried. Are, are you able to just give an overview of the kind of approaches you've thought about or tried or haven't yet, but, but are thinking of trying? It's a, yeah, it's a very, another very good question. Um, Fred, who is our data scientist, would be better to answer that. But I do know that he has tried a couple of different things that have struggled with it. I think he mentioned using the Google Tesseract engine um, yeah. to form OCR, and that was successful in some manner, but also struggled in others. And I know our IT provider also had a go at using OCR on it. I think they may have used some freeware to, to have a go at it. Nothing, nothing super complicated, but that also yeah. struggled because some... I just think the words are quite irregular and the the sort of data that we wanted extracted from the journals themselves, the, the specific bit of software they used could wasn't able to do that. Sure. Yeah, I think um, our, the initial discussions were with our IT provider um, who said it couldn't be done. <laughs> and then uh, Fred had a go and had some success yeah. uh, with it. But he was saying that it required more work with regards to the structure of the pages. It was struggling with the three columns and it was also struggling, yeah, with the, the typeface, which I think is quite old fashioned. Or variable, and I think. Variable. Yeah. 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 Is that the biggest challenge? So I'm not an expert, but my, my sense is that actually layout um, tends to be fairly regular because you have text boxes generally but it's the unusual typeface that can cause problems because it's not a modern typeface. Am I right or am I, am I, am I wrong there? I think it's a, it's a bit of both really because the journals can, just from flicking through it myself, the journal can be arranged in quite strange ways. There are lots of adverts that have been put in, superimposed in funny places and the tables are kind of a, sometimes a bit skewed as well, just because of the way the printing presses probably worked back in the 19th century. But you're absolutely right with the, um, the typeface as well. It can be a bit archaic and some of the starts of the sentences have a 
larger letter or a different typeface to the rest of the sentence. It's lots of little things like that that kind of add up to, to make it a bit trickier than you might initially think. <laughs> sure. And was it just textual words that we wanted to extract or were there graphic symbols like lines and uh, maybe symbols representing things on a map? Uh, have I misunderstood that? Or No, absolutely. So I think in a, the, the dream situation would be to be able to extract vector data from the maps and from the plans and from the sections, essentially. But I know I think that's quite a big ask. So if we could just determine whether it's a map or whether it's a section and then yeah. tie that to where it is within the journal so it's searchable, I think that would be a, a, a massive help and massively, massively useful. But in terms of extracting other information, such as you say, lines and vector data, I think that that might be a bit trickier. I don't know what you think, Alex. Yeah, I, th I think <laughs> if it's possible, it would be immensely, yeah. immensely useful. Yeah, but I think as a first step, capturing that there's a map which relates to mine X yeah. is, is the first step to knowing, knowing it's there and being able to see what it has on it and whether it's of any use. I think is is the first step. I mean, this whole collection is potentially immensely powerful in in what it contains, and it's just so overwhelmingly large that we haven't looked at it in the last five years. <laughs> yeah, sorry, we. I, you guys want to say we should also say that this one edition from one year has five hundred pages, but then we have from eighteen thirty four eighteen thirty five to 1940 as well so that's 500 pages times 100 which is a lot of information and a lot of data there that we're currently not utilizing <laughs> sure sure and, uh, there's the carry on so i was going to say the, the probably the interesting thing is it, you, we you might be the first person to have looked at it since it was yeah since yeah. it was published i mean <laughs> the information has quite literally uh you know gone into non-existence with passing of time and so there's, sure. there could be some amazing stuff in there there's some really there's some really weird cool stuff in there like the discussion of the plate tectonics and all sorts of weird stuff geological <laughs> ideas um, that, were, that were crazy at the time <laughs> fantastic no, that's great there's a question from um an, uh, from the audience um richard asks um he says just wondering if there's any option to have the original papers re-scanned um, at all, or whether it, the existing is, is what we've got to work with. Um, Richard, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. Is there a reason that you think there's a benefit to um, rescanning? Is it because you think the JPEG format is lossy and therefore we lose some information? And if it was scanned at either a high resolution or using you know, TIFFs, then, then we might have um, greater accuracy. Is that, is that your reasoning? Yeah, well, I've worked on projects with things like the Lloyd's ship registers going back in the past then right. really what you want to do for any of these sort of things is try and get the original source material in the highest resolution you possibly can. Also right. because you can alter the settings when you're scanning and try and potentially reduce that noise, that, that kind of perturbation, whatever you want to call it in the OCR world, but essentially to try and make things as black and white <laughs> in yeah. concept and also in output yeah. as you possibly can, because you can post process that and that's what we, you know, I'd suggest you try and do anyway. Yeah, sure. because you then get a you know then with the with the scanning you're trying to get a solid hit off over a lot of black and then remove anything if it's like a like you know less than a half percent or something of black in a particular <laughs> area to, to yeah. note the fact that that's text or not but um yes yeah, so you can post process that but if you can get a much higher resolution original then then that'd be good but that might okay. be difficult if they've already scanned that and it might be expensive as well so yeah, I think um, yeah we've already paid for the British Library essentially to scan all of these from the microfilms that they stored them on. So I think that is probably a bit out of scope for this for this challenge. But if but if you do identify that that could be a key step in improving the ability to do OCR to use OCR on these, then that could be something that we could evaluate further down the line. Richard, you mentioned that you've done something similar before. Do you want to say a few words about about that at all, or? So to put you on um, the spot there. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's fine. I think what's interesting is not necessarily the, so th there's that whole kind of 50% of the project is doing that, that OCR side of things. And there's another 50% that is sort of the fuzzy logic. We're often looking for, 
in the ship's register. <coughs> Strangely, ships change name quite a lot. So, you know, you might have your dictionary definition of mining terms, which might be the same, but you could probably be sure that one mine over here in Cornwall is probably calling something slightly different or or they might describe yeah. something as being crunchy there and slightly gravelly there or, or whatever, yeah. whatever the mining terms are. <laughs> I'm not a miner, whatever they are. Um, so what we had to do <coughs> with ship's registers was go do some fuzzy matching to try and work out, well, okay, well, these things call this, uh, label a certain weight. Is that similar to that? Um, and is, is part of the name similar to that? So that could be a match to try and then highlight the fact that we, we might have to have some human eyes looking at some of this stuff, but there might be some automatic ways we can try and flag up some things that might be half right. So if you get the first part of a, you know, if you're looking for litho, whatever that phrase was, if you get the first couple of letters, there aren't many things probably in mining that begin with LIT. So search for that or even search for LI. Um, but then look for something else that might be related to that. So if lithium always is, is they're always talking about flowing on water, you mm -hmm. can look for those kind of characters together. Um, yeah. And that might give you some fuzzy matches, but then you start with your most important ones and the ones that are matching more of those things, you might then direct the humans towards some of those things. And then, uh, yeah, if they're really weak matches, just not worry about those. Or, so yeah, that's always an approach that's quite useful. I'm just conscious of time. Um... There's a comment by David, um, uh, uh, just emphasizing the point that some of the mine names aren't consistently spelled. So that, that kind of goes to your point about being flexible in terms of matching. Um, so just to draw things to a close, um, in terms of next steps, um, if um, Cornish Lithium could um, share with us, you know, and I'll share onto the group, um, uh, how we can access um, uh, a sample of these um, scanned images, that'll, get, that'll allow people to get started. Um, and um, Alex, if, if there's a, a primary contact at, at Cornish Lithium, perhaps yourself, um, who, who can kind of answer the odd question that people might have about, about the data and, and um, uh, that, that'd be great. Would, would it be yourself or, or is, that, is that something you're still deciding? Uh, yeah, definitely feel free to uh, email me and um, probably CC Ali in as well. And then we can, okay. if, if I don't know the answer, I'm sure Ali will. I was, sure. was going to say, What's the, how is this going to work moving forwards? Is there going to be sort of some sort of interactive part of this where we can work maybe with somebody or if there are questions or will there be a, will there be a halfway point that we can sort of discuss how it's, how the project's going? Yeah. Um, so we, ha we haven't overly um, 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 defined that. So what we're hoping is that when people, if people are interested, um, they, they kind of take up the challenge and if they want to form groups, they can. What I'll do on my side is, in a in a in a in about sort of in a two months in a eight weeks time, I'll, I'll I'll kind of aim for everyone to get back together on all the different challenges, and and we can you can share what we've been working on. Between now and then, if somebody wants to kind of if somebody's particularly enthusiastic, um, you would be the main contact point. Yeah. If if there's a group or if there needs it to be a little bit more organisation support then get in touch with me and we, we can kind of match that. We, we've never done this before. So we're kind of learning as we go along a little bit. Uh, we don't know if everyone will work individually and come back and say, ta-da, or whether people want yeah. to kind of have regular catch-ups. Um, so we're kind of learning as we go along, really. Fine, yeah, great. Okay. So if you email me um, um, a link to the data and, uh, and uh, the email that you want shared, I'll share that with everyone else. Fantastic. Great. Yeah, Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks, Tarek. And thanks all for yeah, listening. Thank you. That's, that's a really fantastic, um, it's a um, you know, great challenge, really interesting. Um, if you're interested in the next one, you'll have to click on the uh, new link because uh, they're <laughs> all separate links. So um, I'll close down this meeting because the other one's starting in a few seconds. Thanks very much, everyone. Okay. Fantastic. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you all. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Stop.